Hello and welcome to Connected with Latham, where we discuss ideas, legal developments, and business trends shaping the global economy. In this episode of our Energy and Infrastructure podcast series, we're talking about the oil and gas industry in Europe and how the focus on energy transition is impacting our traditional oil and gas clients and their organizations. My name is Lauren Anderson. I'm a partner in the Houston office and a member of the firm's Energy and Infrastructure Industry Group. I'm joined today by Simon Tyso and Sam Newhouse, partners in our London office, and Evelyn Girio, counsel in our London office. Hi, Lauren. Good to be here. Likewise. Thanks, Lauren. Nice to be joining you. Hi, Lauren. Happy to be here. Thanks, everybody. It's great to have you all joining us today. Before we dive into our discussion, I think it'd be great if you could each take a moment just to share a little bit about your backgrounds. Simon, do you want to start? Sure. Um, So I'm a corporate partner uh, based in London. I've been uh, engaged in the oil and gas industry for uh, the best part of 20 years, mainly doing a a mixture of public and private M&A work and also project development. Being based in London, my sort of stomping ground tends to be Europe and uh, the Middle East and and also Africa. Thanks, Simon. Sam, how how about you go next? Yep, delighted to. So I've got a very similar background to Simon. I have uh, sadly slightly shorter tenure than him in just the 18 years. I started off getting interested in the industry, having done a secondment very early in my legal career to one of the majors, and then carried on working primarily, well, across the value chain in the oil and gas industry, private M&A, public M&A, and all over the world, um, and have enjoyed enjoyed the flights, pre-pandemic anyway, uh, round to the weird and wonderful places uh, to do deals across the globe. Well, hopefully we'll be getting back to those soon. Uh, Evelyn? I'm Evelyn Jurio. I'm a counsel um, in the London office, and I have a particular focus on M&A transactions in the energy sector. I also um, advise on project developments. And as Simon said, my geographical focus tends to be the Middle East, Europe and Africa. Great. Thanks so much, Evelyn. Obviously, you guys have a huge amount of experience in the industry. And so I think uh, today's podcast should be really interesting. Just to start things off, Maybe we should begin with a little bit about what is the current state of play in Europe. Evelyn, what are you seeing in the market these days? So the oil and gas sector was hit especially hard in 2020 and commodity prices plummeted in most part due to the price war between Saudi Arabia and Russia, as well as falling consumer demand because of the COVID-19 pandemic and the ensuing lockdowns. However, after a year or so of volatility, M&A activity in the oil and gas sector has in fact increased, and we are seeing a wealth of opportunities out there. Just looking at the figures first, according to figures published by Global Data's Deals Database and quoted in Offshore Technology in June, in the first quarter of 2021, M&A deal value across the global oil and gas industry totaled just over 60 billion US dollars with Europe actually accounting for almost a 15% share of global M&A deal value. So M&A is definitely up. And what is worth noting is that the size of deals and the types of deals we are seeing is changing and evolving. What we are currently seeing is a degree of investment by private equity in the upstream sector, as well as reverse mergers into listed entities, not least because there is no IPO market at the moment. And the drivers for these mergers seem to be the fact that companies are looking to either diversify or consolidate or find liquidity. So I think the takeaway is that whilst we are seeing consolidation by oil majors, we're also seeing a wealth of opportunity. Oil majors are looking to reshape their portfolios, which undoubtedly presents new opportunities for buyers. And the majors are also seem to be leading the way in making the industry sustainable by either looking to expand into renewable technologies and carbon neutral solutions, obviously given the ongoing energy transition. Thanks, Evelyn. That is really helpful background. I'd be curious, Simon, what are your thoughts in terms of what trends are likely to drive oil and gas activity over the next couple of years? Do you think it remains kind of what it is now or do you see that continuing to evolve? It, it's a that's an interesting question. Uh, in term, it's always dangerous having lawyers looking to crystal balls. But I think it's fairly obvious that one of the key drivers, uh, as Evelyn alluded to, is energy transition. That is uh, something that's come to the public consciousness um, in relatively recent days, in, in the last couple of years. Though it's probably worth pointing out that energy transition, and in particular the movement towards lower in carbon intensity in oil and gas work is something that oil and gas companies have been engaged in for a number of years and frankly will be engaged in for a number of years 
to come. It's definitely an ongoing process. However, it is fair to say that it's captured uh, the public imagination and most importantly, probably the capital markets imagination in the last year or so. I think we're seeing something similar, obviously, in the US where you've got a lot of traditional oil and gas companies that are very focused on not only renewable technologies, but also, as you said, sort of the reducing the carbon intensity of their production, which I think you're right, is something they've been focused on for a long time. But I think it's something that certainly seems to be a much larger focus at the moment than than maybe it has been historically. In the US, at least, a lot of that is driven, um, or at least supported by tax incentives that, you know, make those projects really, you know, economic. Is that the case in Europe as well? Or are you guys seeing more of, of social or political drivers pushing Sam, what do you think about that? I think we've seen a huge amount of potential opportunity in the sector at the moment based around the shifts going on at a macro level, whether that be from pandemic, whether it be from energy transition related points. All of those we think are certainly playing into the mergers and acquisitions world in Europe. We've obviously seen majors looking to reshape their portfolios consistent with what Simon's just touched on uh, in terms of focus of types of energy assets, consolidating in particular jurisdictions, and generally revisiting their portfolios to work out what makes sense for them uh, over the next however many years. That throws up a huge amount of opportunity, both for buyers and others looking to reshape their portfolios as well. So I think the figures which Evelyn touched on right at the beginning have really been born out of that. And it makes it quite an interesting, exciting time as everybody's going on their own sort of separate journeys, as it were, into the future with their plans around both sort of conventional hydrocarbons and transition too. And I think what, one of the points that maybe I'm, I'm saying this because we've all said it for quite a while and eventually if you say something long enough, you've got to be right eventually, is around potential for mergers in the sector. I think we've seen a couple of, certainly in Europe, a couple of interesting large-scale transactions of people reversing into each other or, or significant portfolios um, in the UK, in the Norwegian North Sea and more broadly across Europe generally taking place. But I think there's still potentially scope at the moment for some of the larger mergers that have been long rumoured among the sort of either mid cap companies or, or majors to take place where people are really looking at their, their portfolios and thinking, OK, great. Well, our future looks like this. Their future looks like this. And actually, together, we've got a, we've got a fantastic portfolio based around that. So either looking in terms of strength or, or slightly defensive as well to say, OK, we're going to consolidate our position and here's, here's the best way of doing it. We can de-lever further, we can focus further on, on particular basins uh, and we'll do that in strength. So I, I think there's a potential as we move forward, not just for the M&A that we've seen and will continue to see, but also potentially for mergers as well. And, and Lauren, have you? If I can throw a question back at you, I know you're supposed supposed to be the question master, but uh, have you seen similar in the US recently? Yeah, I mean, you're definitely starting to see that consolidation um, starting really this year. Obviously, last year I think was a little bit quiet as everybody sort of waited out to see what was going to happen in terms of you know price stability and other things. But I do think we are starting to see that in the US, and I think it's being driven by a lot of the same things. One being, you know, you're seeing some smaller producers who are starting to consolidate to achieve a larger scale, which I think is going to be a good thing for the industry. And then, you know, I think we'll start seeing, as you suggested, some of these larger mergers as well for exactly the reason you articulated, which is just that I think companies are really assessing kind of what does their portfolio look like, where are their strengths and where are they headed? And is it going to be easier to get there if they can consolidate with somebody else who who enhances those advantages or adds to them. So I think we are seeing that. And I guess that sort of leads us into, I guess, the next topic I was hoping we could talk about. We've discussed um, a little bit about energy transition and renewables, but what are you guys seeing just in terms of more traditional oil and gas? Maybe Sam, I can throw it to you to start. I think in terms of just traditional oil and gas, and if by that, I think we're just looking at upstream. I think we've continued to see a, a good deal of M&A in that sector. I mean, the, the UK North Sea is obviously a relatively mature basin. We've seen quite a few people looking to downsize their portfolios there and reconsolidate elsewhere. And that's been quite interesting and exciting because it's brought in 
new capital and it's also brought in a kind of new wave of custodian into the North Sea, whether that be private equity, new players, spin-offs from the majors, all of which have come in with kind of new enthusiasm to help bring the basin forward and develop in a way that's consistent with what investors are expecting in 2021. So that's been a really interesting form of play. And I think we've also seen that in other jurisdictions, Norwegian North Sea in particular, we've seen it in Holland and to some degree, but maybe in a slightly different form in Germany as well. I think that's probably a story we're seeing globally as well. Lauren, I presume we often look to the um, US for our kind of precedents and particularly to see how uh, how the industry will shape. I think there have many things that have been called out that have been quite interesting. Uh, I think the influx of private equity, I think the US pulled out the kind of infrastructure components of oil and gas, perhaps ahead of Europe. Maybe for once the kind of energy transition reshaping was ahead in Europe. And there were bits and pieces that have come out of that that may be informative for the US. Do you think that's fair comment or, uh, or, or do you think actually that it was the other way around? No, I think it's a fair comment. I mean, I think certainly we in the US market seem to, you know, think of Europe as being ahead, particularly in some of the renewable technologies and things that I think are much more prevalent uh, in Europe than they have historically been in the US. And so I think we actually do at times sort of look to Europe, particularly in that sense, at saying, okay, this is what the market's done there um, and what might be an analog in the US. Of course, you know, as I mentioned before, I think the fact that a lot of the renewable activity uh, in the US is so tax driven, obviously it changes a bit the way the structures of those transactions look just to achieve the tax equity benefits that um, really, you know, everybody's looking for in the US. But I think you're right. I think it has been you know, that's grown much faster in Europe. Whereas you're right, I mean, I think in terms of the infrastructure split out, I mean, you were seeing, you know, midstream pipeline deals and other things being split out and separately invested in by private equity in the US for a number of years. And I think that continues to be a really strong area for the energy industry right now is is that infrastructure component in particular, where you are still seeing both you know, private equity and public investment. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there. And I think that, you know, the consolidation we're starting to see in the upstream space is going to create opportunity as well. Yeah, Lauren, I I agree with that. And I think that globally, that uh, move towards this spin out of infrastructure, or at least investment in infrastructure is is gaining momentum. And, And in some ways, the oil price difficulties and difficulties in the public market, some people have pointed to, have given a greater opportunity for these things to happen. If we look at the very large infrastructure fund backed investments into midstream infrastructure in Saudi and and the UAE. We look at some deals that have recently been done with uh, for for LNG uh, infrastructure as well, where where you've got funds, again, investing in either actual or or virtual, as it were, arrangements in relation to that. There is an opportunity here that's presenting itself to infra funds in particular that perhaps was difficult for them to compete with a few years ago. But the need for increased capital, for the deployment of capital elsewhere, is making, I think, oil and gas companies in particular think more broadly about the sort of deals that they want to do and, and how they're going to achieve them. And some of that technology that you guys have so been so good at inventing over in the US is now finally getting its long awaited airing outside of the US. Well, and it's a huge opportunity too, I think, for strategics to be able to not have to commit and sink so much of their own capital into these projects. And the cost of capital from the infrastructure funds is usually, you know, I think strategics are finding that it's very compelling. Um, and it creates a real opportunity for them to be able to develop these very large scale projects without the capital intensity that they would have otherwise had if they were going it alone. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. And I think that the the difference now, those things have always been true. I think the difference is now that that you're beginning to find on the the, the investee side uh, a greater willingness to to get over some of the difficulties, relatively small, but some of the difficulties that that lack of being completely vertically integrated create um, in order to get that major advantage of of releasing some of those those capital costs that, that they would otherwise have to incur. I guess maybe the next topic that that would be, I think, sort of relevant to what we're talking about, we've spoken quite a bit about sort of the shifting nature of the capital that's being invested in energy right now, particularly in Europe. Um, Evelyn, I don't know if you have any uh, additional thoughts on that. Thanks, Lauren. I I think that it's clear that lenders um, have been coming under pressure to, to restrict oil and gas targeted lending. 
Though I think as an observation, there still seems to be a debt out there. And I think the figures that were mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, the fact that deal value is up and the size of deals appears to be increasing, means that players in the industry think that there is money to be made, at least in, in the midterm. It therefore seems that at the moment, provided lenders see evidence that projects themselves are carbon neutral or that CCS is being considered, debt financing can be obtained. Granted, banks may be a bit more sensitive to these issues, but there definitely seems to be a willingness to lend. That is really interesting. So I think we're going to go ahead and wrap things up, but this was obviously a great discussion. A huge thanks to Simon, Sam, Evelyn for this really interesting insight into the oil and gas industry across Europe and some insights into what we may see in the future and what we're seeing right now. It's Truly been a pleasure. Thanks, Lauren. Much appreciated. Thanks for having us. Good to be here. And thank you to our listeners for checking out this episode of the Energy and Infrastructure Podcast in our Connected with Latham series. Stay tuned for more episodes coming soon where we'll cover other key topics in the evolving energy and infrastructure sector. You can subscribe and listen to new and archived episodes of Latham's podcasts on LW.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen to your podcasts. If you'd like more information about the topics in this podcast, please email us using the links located in the show description. We hope you'll join us again next time. This podcast is provided as a service of Latham & Watkins, LLP. Listening to this podcast does not create an attorney-client relationship between you and Latham & Watkins, LLP, and you should not send confidential information to Latham & Watkins, LLP. While we make every effort to assure that the content of this podcast is accurate, comprehensive, and current, we do not warrant or guarantee any of those things. And you may not rely on this podcast as a substitute for legal research and or consulting a qualified attorney. Listening to this podcast is not a substitute for engaging a lawyer to advise you on your individual needs. Should you require legal advice on the issues covered in this podcast, please consult a qualified attorney. Under New York's Code of Professional Responsibility, portions of this communication contain attorney advertising. Prior results do not guarantee a similar outcome. Results depend upon a variety of factors unique to each representation. Please direct all inquiries regarding the conduct of Latham & Watkins attorneys under the New York's disciplinary rules to Latham & Watkins, LLP, 885 3rd Avenue, New York, New York, 10022-4834, phone number 1212-906-1200.